This lesson is for section 10.4 on graphing higher degree functions. Our objectives for today are to graph higher degree polynomials using factor theorem. And we're also going to use our calculator to find the maximum and minimum of a function in a given interval. So make sure you do have your calculator with you. So earlier in the semester, we actually did look at some higher degree functions. We just didn't graph them. What we did was we factored them using factor theorem. So in this lesson, we'll briefly review factor theorem and other methods of factoring, um, but mainly we're going to try to focus on graphing a higher degree function. Now, in order to really understand this particular lesson, you need to make sure that you are very comfortable with all the terminology here in this box. So please know the difference between each and every single one of these terms. All right, let's start with a brief review of synthetic substitution. Now, if I ask you to evaluate g of 3, I'm asking you to input x equals 3 into your function. So you probably would want to just substitute 3 everywhere you see an x, and that would certainly be correct. But we learned a different method earlier this semester for evaluating this function. So instead of using just direct substitution here, we can actually use something called synthetic substitution, which looks exactly like synthetic division. So I'm just going to set it up real quick. So we're using the coefficients of our polynomial. We're going to place the 3 on the outside of that bar. So we complete this process like we typically would with synthetic division. So I drop the 1, I multiply 3 times 1, I add, multiply 3 times negative 1, I add the terms together, multiply 3 times 2, I get 6, and if I add here, I end up with negative 7. Now this negative 7 represents the remainder if you were to take your polynomial x cubed minus 4x squared plus 5x minus 13, and if you were to divide that by x minus 3, you would have a remainder of negative 7. So here to me is the really cool part. I know that sounds nerdy, but not only is that the remainder okay, of your function if you were to divide it by x minus 3, but it also tells you what the function value is when it's evaluated at x equals 3. In other words, g of 3 is equal to negative 7. So we have the coordinate 3 comma negative 7 on the graph of this function. So to tie it into the vocabulary terms above, what this also tells us is that x equals 3 is not a root or in other words, a zero okay, of your function, um, which in this case is g of x. So it's not a root or zero of g of x, because if it were a root or a zero, this remainder should be zero here instead of you know, a different value. So that's important here, um, and we're going to use that idea now when we start graphing our function. OK, in example two, the directions have us finding all zeros of the given function. So this is important, the fact that it says all zeros, that means we're looking for real and complex roots or zeros. Roots and zeros mean the same thing. Okay, So we're looking for all complex roots and zeros. So remember, a zero is any value of x that satisfies the equation f of x is equal to zero. So what we're going to do is set this function here equal to zero and try to solve. Now in order to solve, what we're going to have to do is actually factor. Okay, And in order to factor this particular polynomial, we're going to use factor theorem. So go ahead and grab your calculator now. I've already um, inputted this into my calculator. And um, if I graph this function here, I see that I have two real zeros here. So it crosses the x-axis. It looks like it's at negative 2, but let's make sure we verify that. So we're going to hit second calc and then 0. Let's go left bound and right bound. And we end up with a 0 of this function at x equals negative 2. All right, so we're going to use synthetic division now. We've got a 0. We'll place that on the outside. We'll use our coefficients. So I'm going to go ahead and pause and then do this work real quick. OK, so as you can see, x equals negative 2 is definitely a 0 of the function because we have a remainder of 0. So now let's continue to factor this polynomial here. I'm going to go back to the calculator, and I'm going to find that other 0. So I'm going to hit second calc, 0. And it looks like it's at x equals 3, but let's just go ahead and verify. Left bound will be down here. Right bound and enter. And it looks like, yep, it's at 3. So what we're going to do now is take 3, and we're going to place the coefficients 1, negative 1, negative 4, negative 6 here. And we'll do synthetic division one more time. All right, so now we have another 0, x equals 3, because we have another remainder of 0. Now left over, we have this quadratic function, x squared plus 2x plus 2. So right now, if we were to just show the factors of this function, we have x squared plus 2x plus 2, x minus 3, and x plus 2. So that's when the function is set equal to 0. That's how we're getting 1, 0, x equals 3, another 0, x equals negative 2. And now we'll find the other zeros that come from this equation here. So what we're trying to do now at this point 
is solve x squared plus 2x plus 2 equals 0. So this right now is a quadratic that cannot be factored, so I'd have to use quadratic formula. Okay, so after applying quadratic formula, you can see here that I end up with a negative discriminant, which means I have an imaginary number here. Uh, but that's okay, because remember, we're looking for real and complex roots or zeros of this given function. So I'm going to go ahead and simplify. We have x equals negative 2 plus or minus, after I pull out that i, 2i divided by 2, which if I simplify is just negative 1 plus or minus i. So right now we have two real roots one at x equals 3 and one at x equals negative 2, and we have two complex roots, one at negative 1 plus i and one negative 1 minus i. So let's list all of them. So we can list this actually as a solution set. Let's do it that way. We have a real one at 3, a real one at negative 2, a complex root at negative 1 plus i, and negative 1 minus i. So here would be all of the zeros for our given function. All right, now in part B, we're asked to find the x and y intercepts of the graph of the function. So this question is similar to what we were asked in part A, but it's not exactly the same. So let's make sure we understand the difference between a zero and an intercept. So let's work on the y intercept. That one's pretty easy to do because if we just plug in zero into our function here, all these terms would drop out and leave me with negative 12. So I have a y intercept at 0, negative 12. So notice I am writing the uh, point here. Um, so make sure you list both coordinates. It's not just negative 12. Now the x-intercepts are related to the zeros of the function, but for the x-intercepts, these have to be real numbers. Okay, so x-intercepts are real numbers. And that's because if we go back to our graph here, you can see we only crossed the x-axis at x equals positive 3 and at x equals negative 2. We're not seeing the complex roots here whatsoever. So your x-intercepts will always be real numbers. So we have two x-intercepts, one at 3, 0, and one at negative 2, 0. So we do not include our complex roots here whatsoever when we talk about the x and y intercepts. These are always going to be real numbers. All right, so everything we've talked about so far now leads us to question 3. Okay, we're going to graph a higher degree polynomial. So we have the polynomial x cubed minus x squared minus 4x plus 4, but we're asked to graph it within the specific domain from negative 4 to 4. So in order to graph this function, I'm going to need to know where the x-intercepts are. Um, but in order to know the x-intercepts, I'll have to find the zeros of the function. So that means I'm solving the equation x cubed minus x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals 0. Now you might think you're supposed to use factor theorem here, but don't always jump to using factor theorem. That should be your last method. Um, because in this case, the reason why we're specifically using this function is because if we group 2 and 2, we can factor by grouping. So if I take out an x squared from the first two terms, I'm left with x minus 1. And if I take out a negative 4 from the second two terms, I'll be left with x minus 1 as well. So now if I uh, just continue factoring here, I have x squared minus 4 times x minus 1 equals 0, which means I have two additional factors, x plus 2 and x minus 2. So here I'm looking at three real zeros, x equals negative 2, x equals 2, and x equals 1. All right, so, so far we know that we have three different x-intercepts because these are all real roots. So we have one x-intercept at negative 2, 0. We have one x-intercept at 1, 0, and another x-intercept at the point 2, 0. Okay, so these represent all of the different places where your function is going to cross the x-axis. Now remember, we're also just trying to graph this function on the interval from negative 4 to 4. So what I'm going to do is use synthetic substitution to evaluate the function at x equals negative 4. So I'm taking p of negative 4 and without actually plugging that into here, we'll just use synthetic substitution. So from synthetic substitution, we see that p of negative 4 is equal to negative 60. In other words, the point with coordinates negative 4, negative 60 lies on the graph of this function. So I'm going to go ahead and plot that point here. Um, negative 4, negative 60 is probably somewhere here. Obviously it's not really drawn into scale, um, but I'm just going to kind of sketch that here. All right, now we also want to graph from the, in the domain negative 4 to positive 4. So let's find that other endpoint. So we'll use synthetic substitution once more to evaluate p of 4. So go ahead and pause here if you want to practice this on your own to make sure you know how to use synthetic substitution. All right, so we know that p of 4 is equal to 36, which means we have a point with coordinates 4, 36 that will lie on the graph of this function. So I'm going to go ahead and also sketch 4, 36, which should lie somewhere up here. 
Now, with only knowing these particular points, I'm going to go ahead and try to sketch this function. So let's think about if we're going from left to right, okay, and we have a domain of negative 4 to 4. That means we're graphing all the values between negative 4 and 4. So I'm starting here at the left endpoint. Now, I can't come across this function like this and come back down through the point negative 2 because now I have an extra x-intercept that won't work. So what I'm going to have to do is go through the point negative 2, 0 like this. Then I'm going to have to come back down so that I can go through the point 1, 0. And of course, because I have to go through 2, 0, I'm going to have to come back up. And then here I connect to 436. So this is what my sketch would look like. Now we're going to verify that with our calculator. So I went ahead and I already plugged this into the calculator, and as you can see, our sketch is pretty good. Okay, That's definitely the behavior of this function here. Um, it's going to cross at negative 2, 0. It's going to come back down, and then the only thing we have left to find is that y-intercept. You can see it clearly here with the tick marks. It's at 0, 4. And we can see it as well from our function. It should be at 0, 4. So this point here is uh, the point 0, 4. All right, to fill in some of this information below, it asks us to find the real and complex zeros here. And in this case, we only had real zeros. There were no complex zeros. So I'm just going to list x equals negative 2, 2, and 1. And for the x-intercepts, we're using the same x values, but we're going to list these as points. So we have x was negative 2, so we have the coordinate negative 2, 0. We have the point 2, 0, and the point 1, 0. Now, for the max and the min of this function, this is where we're going to turn back to our calculator. All right, so finding a maximum means you're looking for any high points that are on the graph of this function outside of the ones that are like way up here because this is going to continue to go to positive infinity. We're not looking for that since that just keeps getting larger and larger. We're looking for values like this here. So this is a relative maximum. It's a high point in the graph of your function. So we're going to find that by hitting second calc and then scroll to four maximum. So let's go left bound of that coordinate. So I think that the high point is here. So I'm just going to hit enter on the left side of that point and enter on the right side of that point. Hit enter one more time. And we have a maximum at negative 0.87 comma 6.06. Okay. So we might ask you to round to a specific um, value. Right now I'm just going to do to uh, the hundredths place. So negative 0.87 and 6.06. .06. All right. Now for the minimum, we'll come back to that graph here and this time we're looking for low points so it looks like we got a low point right here so we'll hit second calc and then this time minimum so number three and let's scroll to the left we were already to the left of that point but I just got a little closer scroll to the right hit enter anywhere hit enter one more time and we have a minimum at 1.54 comma negative 0.88 okay so 1.54 comma negative 0.88 all right, so let's go back now to our sketch here and let's make sure we label those coordinates. So we have what's called a relative max. And instead of calling it a maximum, I've also seen it written as a maxima. Um, it doesn't matter which one you call it. We're going to call it a relative max. And uh, that's the coordinate negative, um, what was it, 0.87 comma 6.06. .06. We also have this relative min here. Okay, and this is the coordinate 1.54 comma negative 0.88. All right, so that completes this problem. So this is what we want to see when you're sketching. Um, make sure you ignore the book's directions in your homework. Uh, this is what we want you to do. So you're going to find your zeros. You're going to find um, the max and the min using your calculator, and you're just going to give a sketch when it gives you a specific domain. All right, guys, that's the end of the lesson. So um, nice job. I'll see you guys in class tomorrow.